Hey, good morning. Happy Wednesday. Hope things are going good for you. I found this wonderful picture of a, a sunflower. It kind of reminds me of Plants vs. Zombies. I don't know if you guys ever played that game, but it was pretty cool. And the whole idea is to get sunflowers so you can get energy so you could build the fences so the zombies couldn't come and, and take your lawnmowers, much less get in your house. And I said, man, this is a quality picture, but when I put it in here, and I was just looking at it, it comes from a site called HopeForTheBrokenHearted.com, which is rather depressing. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. So anyway, uh, this is our agenda for today. We're going to uh, talk about the test, which is Lessons 19 through 21. We're going to learn a new construction called the Future Passive Participle. We're going to talk about purpose expressions and how they're going to affect our future. And then we're going to talk about how things are going to be wrapped up. As always, uh, please uh, get working on your makeup work. Um, the end is near. The end is near. The test is going to be scheduled for next Wednesday. There's not going to be any vocab on it. But some of the things I'm going to ask you to do is manipulate the ego knows to and woes from your charts. Um, you're going to have to be able to form uh, o -R -A -E -B -E uh I had you write that out. Uh, you're going to have to work with um, Ali Kui and Quidam. And then you're going to have to work with future passive participles and, and how that kind of ties into what we're looking at. And that's what we're going to be working with today, future passive participles. So not, not too earth-shattering. And the next section of the test, uh, everything you see in blue are things that really depend on us getting through this lesson. This is one of the longer lessons that I do. It's probably one of the more complicated in the fact that it has many different parts, uh, grammar speaking. Um, and what's kind of interesting is with uh, this lesson, it sort of begins the end of grammar lessons, and we actually start focusing more and more on culture. So, as for, like if this was, you know, if we were in class in school, we would have probably hit this lesson maybe four or five weeks ago, and we would be working more on uh, something that you would have been interested in translating. Um, once we finish with this grammar piece, um, I actually let the Latin three class decide what you want to translate, whether it's mythology, history, um, Harry Potter in Latin, or The Hobbit, or, you know, whatever, whatever people want to do. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we didn't, we didn't quite make it that far. Um, the other part, uh, I might ask you some questions about what it was like to be a Spartan, uh, which we're going to cover in the next couple of days. Um, any information given in the Roman wedding video or anything that was um, pertinent to Delphi uh, will be fair game as well. Uh, these will be short answer, multiple choice type of questions. And then the translation will just be, you know, what a typical translation is um, with translation questions, but kind of simpler, kind of the way it has been the last two times. Now, the gentleman on the right is Teller from Penn and Teller. And what a lot of people don't know about him is he is a Latin teacher. He spent seven years in the classroom, and he actually made his own Latin textbook, which he still has, which is pretty cool. And I thought, hey, I'm just going to throw his picture in here, so there you go. Okay, so we've studied participles so far. We've seen there's present, active. We've seen perfect passive. Uh, we've seen future active. And then this is the future passive form. It is really easy to form. Uh, basically what you're going to do is you're going to take the present stem of the verb. Remember that stem can be found depending on its conjugation. It may be uh, first and second where you drop off the RE. Then you're home free. Or it may be uh, hey, hey, ho, ho, that O's got to go. And then whatever that stem is, you're going to add N-D-U-S if it's first or second. 
E N D U S if it's third or fourth. The reason why this has an E is, you know, with third conjugation verbs, there's not going to be a stem vowel there. And so you're providing one with the E. And it literally translates to about to or um, about to be blanked, going to be blank, blanked, or affixing to be blanked. So here's the verb dokio. And you can see that it's uh, a, a gerund. I mean, a future passive participle. It's got the ND on the end of it. And this literally means I am about to be taught. And because I'm excited by this, I've got the exclamation point. Uh, but that's just there for emphasis, not, nothing more, just a pure joy of learning. So let's, let's see what that looks like. Here we have Lego. And what I want you to do is to form this into a future passive participle. And remember, to do that, you got to figure out what the conjugation is, and then you got to find the base. So here are my conjugations. That ERE under second is supposed to have a hat. And remember, it's the second principal part minus ERE, or the first principal part minus the O. So, Lego doesn't have a hat. It's third conjugation. So I'm going to say, hey, hey, ho, ho. That O's got to go. Hey, hey, ho, ho. That O's got to go. So I've got leg. Man, that's really big. <laughs> and then I, I add E-N-D-U-S because that is what is required. And then I'm, I'm free to drop away. Now what's kind of cool about this is um, our yearbook is called The Legend. And Legendus means about to be read. And so your yearbook is probably sitting at school somewhere in a box. And it's about to be read by you if you ordered one, which is kind of cool. All right, now try this one with Facchio. See if you can do that one. Okay, so I look here and I say, okay, this is definitely third conjugation because there's no hat over the, the E. So I, I go first principal part minus O. Hey, hey, ho, ho, that O's got to go. And so I have F-A-C-I and I add the E-N-D-U-S. So the I stays because it's part of the base. And that literally means about to be made, which is really neat. Okay, this one is fourth conjugation. See the I-R-E right there? So what would this one be? Okay, if you dropped off the O, you're stuck with an Audi, which is kind of like a car. There you go. Audi Indus. About to be heard. Now, this pair, I mean, this, uh, this future passive participle, you know, is used as a participle in sentences. And because it ends with a U.S., it can be declined in first or second declension. You know, the oos, ah, boom pattern that you've seen uh, since the beginning of the class. Well, the reason why future passive participles are important is because they're used for something called a periphrastic. It's probably one of the best known constructions in uh, Latin. A lot of people can't say periphrastic, so try saying it. It's like fantastic or elastic, but it's a periphrastic. Um, see if you can say periphrastic. Periphrastic. It's always funny trying to hear people say that word. What does periphrastic mean? It means that the verb of the sentence shows obligation or necessity. 
Now, what does that sound like in English? Um, well, normally when we're showing that kind of thing, we'll use the imperative mood like take out the trash. But a paraphrastic would flip it and say the trash must be taken out. That would be a, a use of necessity. So um, when I see it in a sentence, I'll see that it's located toward the end of the sentence. Do you see that ND right there? That's going to be the clue. And if it's a paraphrastic, it's going to have to have a form of sum. This is the old participle sum corporation, except now this is kind of a brand new field uh, they're going into, uh, which is the paraphrastic field. So pecunia uh, is the word for money. See how the A on the end there? That's your subject, it's nominative. The money, and then translate this, must be seen. And then you have this weird dative here floating around, mihi. This is called dative of agent. A dative of agent basically establishes who must perform the obligation or necessity. It's kind of like uh, an album of a personal agent, except this one's in the dative. And it's only used with paraphrastics, so you're not going to see it floating around in a sea of murkiness. So the money must be seen by me. And uh, I don't know if you remember Jerry Maguire, but... That's in a movie with Tom Cruise, and throughout the movie, it was, they kept saying, show me the money, uh, which is kind of, kind of, I guess, funny. Okay, so here's another example, and I don't know if you can read what the, the picture is. It's a poet, Robert Frost, who was famous in the uh, mid-20th century. He says, half the world is composed of people who have something to say and can't, and the other half who have nothing to say and keep on saying it, which might be how you feel about this lecture by now. Uh, it's definitely one of the longer lectures for sure. Um, once more, I'm looking at the ND here. I see it's next to the Zoom. So I'm thinking paraphrastic. I have the story, fabula, must be told. And then I have this poeta here. Now this poeta could be genitive. It could be dative. It's like the story of the poet must be told or the story must be told by the poet. And either use would be correct. This could be a genitive possession or it could be uh, a dative of agent. Either one would work. Um, I'm thinking more dative of agent just because there's a paraphrastic next to it and they usually come together but you would not be wrong thinking either way about that. Okay, so um, I see I've got complindus est. I've got this ND right there. And that ND uh, usually means paraphrastic. Um, is there a form assumed to the right? Yes, there is. So uh, complindu est, um, it can mean completed, it can be filled up. A phones is a fountain or spring, which is why this picture's here. The fountain must be filled up, must be completed. And I've got kiwi bus here. Uh, this is the word from kiwis, kiwis, it means citizen. It can be dative or ablative because of the ibus on the end. And I'm thinking it's probably going to be dative because this is a paraphrastic and so I'll say the spring must be completed by the citizens by the date of agent okay so um, I think you get an idea of what we're working toward um, the last part of this lesson uh, is going to be dealing with ancient Sparta and if you don't know anything about Sparta you may have heard the English term, uh, he lives a Spartan life, which means just the basic necessities, not, nothing frivolous about this person. If you know anything about ancient Greece, uh, this is a rough timeline of Greek civilizations. We can see that uh, Sparta was founded somewhere between 1000 BC and 900 BC. 
just to put it in to historical terms for referencing, Rome wouldn't be founded until 753. So it's, it's a much older civilization than ancient Rome was. A lot of folks don't know exactly where Sparta is, although they know a lot about Sparta. Here's Athens right here in the pink. It's on the Attic Plains. But Sparta is actually on the Peloponnese, which is what this hand-like thing looks like. And you can see Sparta's right here in a place called Laconia. Um, it's in a very uh, mountainous region, uh, but there are some fertile plains around it. And, and Athens itself is on a uh, fertile plain. You can see the plain right here, which is kind of neat. Uh, when you think of Spartans, I, I don't know exactly what you think of, but I think of uh, fierce warriors, antagonistic, strong, determined, that kind of thing. And then just to kind of introduce the whole idea of Sparta, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about your childhood. Do you, do you remember your childhood? I mean, obviously you're 15, 16, 17, 18. It's not like you're going way, way, way far back. Um, a lot of people, they get really nostalgic when they start talking about their young days, uh, when things were less complicated, uh, when you worried about what kind of cookies you got for your snack, or uh, you enjoyed going outside and playing uh, one of the things that I like about these pictures is the sense of uh, curiosity, except for this young lady here, and the fact they don't have any uh, technology uh, with them. Um, they're outside for the most part, or they're reading books, and I, I feel like that's something that you know should be encouraged with the young people. The technology will get you at some point. Let's try not to make it as early as it seems to be today. Uh, who made you who you are? Uh, what made your childhood special? Uh, was it your parents or an uncle or an aunt? Uh, grandparents, neighbors? Um, what made it such a pleasant experience for you? Uh, what made it so joyful? In our family, we have, um, we have a couple of silly traditions which makes no sense to anybody but our family. Uh, this is Caleb. He's celebrating a birthday. And uh, in our family, we have a uh, family party, which is just us. And and then we have um, the big family party where cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents will come over and celebrate. At the family party, we don't do birthday cakes. We do sponge cakes. And so this is actually a sponge from Publix where shopping is a pleasure with candles on it. And you wouldn't want to eat that, but you could clean with it afterwards, I suppose. Uh, that's just a silly thing that we do. Um, and, and, and that is a tradition, and, and we still do it to this day. Um, awkward photos. Uh, this is Caleb leading a karate class. He didn't know I took the picture. And this is Benji using a camera, doing a selfie, and then... Here we are at the angel oak tree. Um, you have no idea probably how many pictures your parents have of you on film, whether they told you they were taking them or not. Um, tons and tons and tons. One of the things that interests me was, all, if you look closely at all these pictures, is you can see that there's an a, a underlying theme of, of nurturing grace and love. So I decided to do a little research, and I found out that love is hard to define. A lot of people try to define it. A lot of people try to explain it. And um, I thought it's interesting that it's one of the most searched items on Google. And these are just some descriptions. The, the one I like is um, the one by The Independent, a temporary insanity driven by hormones. So hopefully, uh, you're not in the throes of that right now, but it's hard to define. But even though you can't define it, you can see it when you look at people. You can see um, it in parenting or in caregiving or in siblings or in friends. Um, there's definitely something there that has an underlying sense of happiness that normally you wouldn't find um, 
there's no bullying, there's no picking on, on people or anything like that. It's just a sense of joy. And it's something that normally, in a, in a normal household, you'll see exhibited from an early age and will extend all the way up through the trials and tribulations of the teenage years. And if you're fortunate and then you survive and your parents don't, don't uh, kick, you know, I was trying to be funny, I'm not going to be funny about that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, okay, I'm just going to go on. And, and you can see that happy relationships are a result of, of this nurture and grace. Um, one of the things I like about Publix where shopping is a pleasure is most of their commercials have this as an underlying theme. The sad thing is I understand it's not something that everybody has. As a matter of fact, probably most people don't have it. Um, it's an idealized version uh, that you see on TV. And by having all this, you come up with that awkward question that, that you hear sometimes people talk about. Are you safe at home? If you're in an environment where you have all this nurture, grace, and love, you're going to be safe. But what, what if that's not something you have? What if you have something totally different? Do you feel safe at home? And if you don't feel safe at home, this would be a good time to talk to a counselor or a teacher or get help. Don't, don't put yourself in a situation where you can't be successful or where you live in fear. Life is too short for that. And you may say, okay, Wagner, what's all this got to do with life? Well, it has to do with how people were raised in Sparta. Sparta is a totally different animal. Uh, all these things we're talking about didn't happen with Sparta. Um, Sparta was totally different. Um, they basically were a military society and, and they believed that fighting for your country and dying for your country is the ultimate goal. This was the uh, mound raised at Thermopylae where the 300 Spartans lay buried. And there's a plaque that says, go tell the Spartans, passerby, people are just coming by the monument. Monument, They hear obedient to their laws, we lie. Meaning we fulfilled what Spartan soldiers are supposed to do. Supposed to die in battle for honor and glory. Their theme was come back with your shield or on it. Which is pretty harsh. This is a painting of, of Sparta. Um, it's uh, sensationalized. It's, it's Renaissance. This is the remains. There aren't a whole lot. Uh, Sparta was eventually abandoned um, around the turn of the millennial. Uh, going from BC to AD, uh, you can see some of the ruins. But you know, Spartan life means that there's not going to be a lot of artistic statues or anything like that. There's just going to be the buildings themselves, and you can see the rugged terrain that's behind it right here, which is pretty neat. Uh, this is a nice overhead view of of, of what it probably uh, looked like under its greatest extent. And that takes us to the reading, which is where we're going to stop for today. Okay, so I spent probably a lot longer teaching you this than I wanted to, which is okay. So your assignment for today is going to be to uh, make a Google Doc. Not Doc. Inside the Google Doc, you're going to say Sparta. And that's it. And then you're going to send that to me. Or actually, just, just write the word Sparta in an email and send it to me, and then you'll get credit for today's lesson. Fair enough? And we'll call this uh, in the grade book uh, Sparta, I guess. All right, kids. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you like the channel, make sure you uh, leave a good comment and subscribe. And I'll see you tomorrow on Thursday. Have a good day.